In the last part of the class, I want to talk about regularization techniques, again using the example of linear least squares regression. So regularized linear least squares regression means we add a penalty term on the parameters w with a suitable norm. So we minimize the linear least squares loss, so, such as the mean square error, and add lambda, a hyperparameter, multiplied with a norm of w. So this aims at reducing the fluctuations or differences in the values of the parameters w. Why should we do this? So the purpose of this is on one hand to reduce the expressiveness of the model deliberately by reducing such fluctuations in the parameters w. And this allows us to control the bias variance trade-off via uh, the hyperparameter lambda. So this is a way to avoid overfitting of the model by adding this regularization term. On the other hand, uh, there are numerical uses of doing this. So consider, for example, that you're doing linear least squares regression and two of your feature functions are very similar. You don't really need either of them in order to fit the solution, but because these functions are very similar, you can assign a large positive weight to one and a large negative weight to the other, and they will essentially cancel. Such unnecessarily large fluctuations in the values can cause numerical problems, and it is better to avoid them, for example, with regularization. Finally, we may want to have certain structures in our solution, mathematical structures, so for example, sparsity. Let's say uh, we are interested in obtaining a parameter vector w, which has many zeros and few non-zero values, for example, because we want to assign an interpretation to the solution. We want to understand which feature functions have significant uh, relevance in representing the solution. And in this case, it makes sense to use a prior or a um, uh, penalty term, which enforces many zeros. There are different regularization methods, depending on which norm we use to regularize the W parameter. Tikhonov regularization or rich regularization for regression, that means rich regression, uses an L2 norm, so penalizes the square norm of the W vector. It is probably the most commonly used type of regularization, and it just avoids unnecessarily large solutions by keeping the norm of the W vector close to zero, as close as possible. Lasso or L1 regularization and L0 regularization both aim at obtaining sparse solutions, so solutions with many zeros. Lasso or L1 regularization does not exactly do this, but can still have small positive or small non-zero values in W, whereas L0 regularization will really get zeros in the W vector, but L0 regularization is hard to train. Elastic nets are a combination between L1 and L2 regularization. They are simply a mix of both terms and can be used to interpolate between L1 and L2 regularization. Let us first speak about L2 or rich regularization. Using linear least square regression, this is rich regression. We like to work in a high-dimensional feature space. So um, let's say we have original coordinates, ri, and we use feature functions, phi1 through phi n, in order to featureize these data and then perform linear least squares regression in the features xi. Now, because we, we are working in feature space and possibly high-dimensional feature space, there is the danger of overfitting, and we want to avoid this because we want to minimize our prediction error or validation error. To avoid overfitting, 
we penalize the norm of the solution. So we are looking for small parameter vectors w which still lead to a good result. And we tune our hyperparameter lambda so as to minimize the prediction error or val validation error. So this will not minimize our training error. The minimal training error will be obtained if we simply set lambda to zero and we don't do any regularization. Regularization is only useful for the prediction error or out of sample error, not for the training error. Now using this loss here, this rich loss for linear least square regression, we can still obtain a closed form of the solution as with unregularized linear least squares. And the solution is simply the following. The optimal parameter vector w equals a matrix inverse times the covariance matrix of x and y. But now the matrix that is being inverted is not simply the covariance matrix of the data x transposed x, but it is that covariance matrix plus a regularization term lambda i, so a small multiple of the identity matrix, uh, so a small diagonal matrix. And uh, this then means that W can be represented as the inverse of a regularized covariance matrix multiplied by this XY covariance matrix. And uh, the interesting part about this solution is that it can actually be literally computed like this. So in the unregularized uh, solution, or if in the solution of unregularized linear least square, which was simply x transposed x inverse times x transposed y, so the same thing without lambda i, we uh, did have the problem that we cannot easily compute the inverse or we cannot, it is at least not recommended to do a direct inversion and the reason for that is that x transposed x can have eigenvalues close to zero. It's in principle as a symmetric positive definite matrix so it should only have positive eigenvalues but in practice it can have eigenvalues that are very close to zero and for numerical reasons we can even have some negative eigenvalues in at least in a numerical in a numerical solution um, but this is avoided if we add this regularization matrix lambda i to x transposed x this shifts the spectrum to the right so to the positive values and it moves everything which was really close to zero to a small positive number. And then this matrix can be actually inverted without problems. So you see in the solution the regularized covariance matrix CXX is very similar to the unregularized one. It just contains the small additive diagonal contribution and this estimator for a covariance matrix is actually called a shrinkage estimator in statistics. Now talking about sparsity inducing regularizations, we have L0 regularization where we basically add a regularization term which just counts the number of non-zero elements and penalizes that. That is structurally a nice regularization term because it really generates zeros in the solution vector w, but it is very hard to solve. So trying to find the optimal parameter vector w with such a regularization basically amounts to solving a combinatorial optimization problem, and that is hard. L1 regularization is easy to solve. Uh, it just consists of adding a regularization term which penalizes the sum of the absolute values of w. It has the disadvantage that it will not necessarily generate true zeros. It may generate a solution vector which has many values close to zero, but if we are actually interested in a sparse solution, we then need to additionally truncate the small values in a subsequent step. Elastic net is often used if we are interested in a sparse solution, but we also want to start with an 
easily obtainable solution. So um, because rich regularization, L2 regularization is so easy to solve, we can start with that and we can then use an elastic net where we change the alpha from 1 to 0 and therefore go, go from the L2 regularization gradually to the L1 regularization and that will be easier to optimize than direct L1 regularization. Finally, I want to say a few words about how to do optimization in practice if we have a complex estimator uh, or a complicated learning problem. So in the example of linear least squares that we have used in this lecture, this was not an issue, simply because we can easily write down the solution of the learning problem. But if we are training a neural network, the training procedure is slow and we have many, many hyperparameters or possible choices for the architecture of the neural networks, uh, of the neural network, and therefore it is not trivial to search over these hyperparameters. We cannot do an exhaustive search anymore. So we see, need something like a heuristic, a practical approach to see if we are underfitting or overfitting and are we close to a reasonable solution or not. And a typical way to approach this problem is to first establish a proxy for a good error rate or an optimal error rate. For example, uh, we could use something like the performance of an expert, a human expert, in a classification task. So that would give us an idea of the classification accuracy that we would like to obtain. And uh, we are then choosing a neural network architecture train it, ask is the training error still high compared to our gold standard or expert performance and if yes that means we are uh, underfitting. So we are, uh, our, our network architecture is not expressive enough to get close to the human error. And in this case we are going for a bigger model or a model that is somehow more expressive. This is always assuming that we have enough training data to actually get close to our target performance. Now, once we have a model that can give us good training performance, we ask what is the validation error. So we score the model on out of sample data, on data that was held back during training. If uh, the validation error is high, so significantly higher than the training error, so there is a generalization gap, then we are overfitting. We have fitted the training data well, but we are not doing well of, on out of sample data. So our model is too expressive or needs to be regularized. So, or perhaps we need more data. So we add more data or we regularize our model or we search over model architectures that still achieve a low training error, but also achieve a lower validation error or a validation error that is closer to the training data. Once both training and validation errors are close to each other and are small compared to our gold standard, we are done. 